Hello and welcome to Arts Alive Books. My name's Jerry Smith. Uh, joining me on this edition is Stephen Gerrard Hayden, who tonight is going to be talking about his children's book, Cobblestone Kids. And later in the show, we visit the Wayward Festival, an inspiring writing and reading programme featuring events and activities made for families, children, young adults, which took place recently in Chester Town Hall. But first of all, Stephen Gerrard Hayden, you're very welcome. Pleasure. Um, we're going to talk in a little bit about your book, Cobblestone Kids. Yeah, but sure. Can you tell us a little bit, first of all, about uh, your background, where you're from, and how you got into writing and so on? Well, I was actually born in Prescott, Whiston Hospital. Um, I was raised in Widnes. I lived there for, what, a good 26 years. I went to South Wales, married a Welsh lady, and I um, lived in Cart, Newport, Pontypool, Cumbran, and I've been in Warrington now for 15 years. I tend to move around with work, you know. Mm. Yeah, as my roof, I've got my own roofing business, okay. flagging as well in the summer, and attempt just to, you know, do that and go where I'm needed, really. And how does the writing fit into all of this? Well, the writing, basically, I started off in about 2006 writing a small sort of script. I don't know whether you remember the Bazooka Joes or a little cartoon in them, it was like a little cartoon inside. I always remember reading those very, very vividly, and... Uh, I thought I'd try to write my own, or at least the first part of a comic. And of course, that led to doing a chapter, which went to 24 chapters, which went to, uh, what, 191 pages and 44,000 words. Mm. And now we have Cobblestone Kids, which has sold now well for about seven years, right. on both Kindle and in paperback. More Kindle now than any, any other. And it's, it's done very well, you know. So I've enjoyed the journeys that I've had with it. I've done countless Waterstone signings and borders, and I've toured Ireland with it all over the country. And it, it's been quite an adventure. It's an adventure book, but in itself, it's been an adventure for me. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start off with like a seed, you get an oak tree before you know it, and that's the way it is with the book. Yeah. I never planned to write a book. I mean, I'm not even an avid reader. I don't read a great deal, but I've still written this book, you know, I'm quite proud of it in that sense, but nonetheless, I'd like to think it happened by chance more than me being a great author, which I'm certainly not. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about the book then. I mean, the story, the setting, and, and who you imagine the audience would be for it. Well, the audience is certainly uh, teens into, even adults. I mean, I've had the Waterstone sign-ins in Chester going back a few years ago. There was a lady of 90, 82, rather, who bought the book. And guys usually between 40 and 50 like to buy it. I don't know whether that's because it's my age group, but, you know, they tend to come over and they're interested in the title, mm -hmm. The Cobblestones. Yeah. You know, we think of Coronation Street, we think of the cobbles, the cobblestones, you know, Liverpool, Manchester, and indeed all over the country, really. The back streets were full of cobbles, the back-to-back -back houses. He had an entry that was made of cobblestones, and I grew up playing on those as well as I'm sure other people did who's probably a bit you know, older than me, certainly not younger. And that's it gives it this sort of hardened feel to the book. These kids are cobblestone kids. They're tough, rough and ready children mm. who largely come from subcultural backgrounds and have been mistreated, neglected in, in many ways, you know. And the reason I wrote the book is so that kids can, you know, overcome that. Often they stay that way, they grow that way, you know, mm. they live their lives that way. But it's just to show that uh, they can achieve and they can overcome poverty. They can overcome the scourges of being classed as, I don't know, subcultural in that sense and, and not being able to do anything. A teacher once said to me when I was nine that I'd never achieve anything. He said, you're useless, you'll never achieve anything. Mm -hmm. And I was telling a friend before that um, that actually made me achieve something. It could have gone the other way, I could have yeah. believed him, but it, it made me more tenacious in actually doing something. You know, I did drift through life through my teens and I was always in trouble, I was always fighting and getting in trouble and stuff, you know, but I knew it couldn't carry on forever. And I was saying that, you know, at school you're expected, if not forced in some um, areas, to learn. Well, I'm a rebel, I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But I decided when I got older that having sort of gone through quite a few rubbishy jobs, I'd had enough of it and I wanted to aspire and earn a bit more money. 
so I went to university at 33. Okay. Now, if I can go to university at 33, there's lots of hope for lots of kids who think, oh, I'm an underachiever, I'll never be anything. Mm -hmm. This book looks and teaches them that they can, irrespective of their, their, their upbringing, the background, or whatever they see themselves as, or they've been told they are, whether it be positive or negative, usually negative in their case. But it's not true. Mm -hmm. it, it's a figment of your imagination. You can achieve, and the kids in the, at the end do achieve to a certain degree. You know. Yeah, yeah, and also the, you're right, the family at the, mo at the beginning is quite dysfunctional and the, they end up finding a kind of alternative family in, in, in the remand home itself. Yeah, it's that's very, right. Very positive. Um, yeah, there's a guy in the book called Reverend Rugrat, you know, or Reverend Gerardin, that's half my name split, and I actually play that character. That's actually me. The poor guy's even got my face as the caricature of my face, which doesn't help matters. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, he, he sort of adopts these kids. He, he's Reverend Rugrat, it's because he is a minister at the end of the day. He's a reverend, a proper reverend, but he's not your God squad sort of guy, you know. He's in touch with the kids in that sense, but he doesn't go over the top. He just teaches them that there's values in having a belief and having a faith. And some people have got that faith. Some people haven't, that's up to them. But some have, and I indeed have myself, but I don't go OTT, I know when to talk about it and when not to talk about it. And Reverend Rugrat instills into these children that even though the parents don't really look after them, don't really want them, you know, they're very much latchkey kids who spend the times on the streets till 11 o'clock at night, that God does in fact love them. He taught that ethic. Now, some might believe it, some might not. It's the same in society. But some kids draw something from that. And it gives them a belief outside themselves. And that, to me, is a very important ethic. That if all else fails, that there is still hope. And these kids are given hope. Yeah, absolutely. When it came to actually writing the book, um, I mean, how did you find the, the kind of dynamics, the discipline of, of sitting down to kind of maybe put 3,000 words on the computer or was it? Yeah, I mean, with me, it's just one of those things. I mean, I, I'd sit back and just, you know, think, OK. I didn't draft out a plan like most. My brother's an author. He's written a couple of books. But he drafts them out mm. meticulously. And, 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 you know, he thinks of everything first. If I was led to think of everything first, I wouldn't even get on a computer, you know. I, I tend to write maybe for hours on end. My second book, Smiler Tyler, which I've not brought today, I wrote that book in 38 hours. It's only, only 13,000 words, but I wrote it in possibly about 38 hours. Not at once, of course, but I counted the hours. Because mm -hmm. once I get on it, I'm on it, and I can be there five hours without even realising I've been on it five hours. The same with this. You know, I, I set about just to start off doing a little comic feature, and I couldn't get off it. My mind was turning out this stuff. All seems to fit in perfectly well. Mm -hmm. I sent the book to a, a competition in Manchester at Northwest Arts, and I won it. And they give me the money for a free read, read with the literary consultancy in London. And my brother said to me, well, they, they're quite fussy, them, you know. I think he was trying to soften the blow for me. But they actually liked it and encouraged me to carry on writing and getting it published, and so I did. But it was all done, you know, yeah. by accident in a way. So I don't want full credit. It was just done by accident in a way, that book. So, so you mentioned one of your other books. Um, are you uh, working on anything else at the moment? Well, my biography, I've had quite a notorious life, um, basically, and it's tied up in, in the book with Reverend Rugrat, as I say, you know. Um, but basically, my biography, Murder, Money and Madness, that comes out in the, in the autumn time. It's been um, written, ghostwritten by a friend, Lynette Sloan, who's a, a, good, a good author herself. She's written many books, and she'll say she's halfway through it. That looks at my life the way it sort of was, it sort of amplified out of, you know, it, it just become a regular in the sense. I lost millions in business, designing a golf, golfing equipment, which I used to do. I lost many millions and subsequently and sadly, I turned to be an alcoholic for seven years. I've now been a non-addict for 15 years and recovered in the methods that you'll find Reverend Rugrat talks about in the book, because that's what I teach the children through. I teach them through my downfall, my failures, my woes. They could either sink me or I could rise above it. And I rose above it with the help of other people, of course, 
and, and obviously I'm able to do what I do today. Been free from drinking for 15 years. And it's, so it's called murder, mayhem and money. Murder, money and madness. Because <laughs> I've been tied up in all those sorts of things in my time. Yeah. And I won't spoil it. You can mm. read the book, obviously, when it comes out. And uh, and is it true that you're making a documentary uh, of this? Uh, well, yeah, I was up. I was up in Sunderland doing a documentary of Cobblestone Kids, which I'm now bringing down to where I'm from, Liverpool, Manchester area. But Murder, Money and Madness has also been scripted for a film. Whether it come go, comes off, I mean, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But I keep hearing it closely, and things are developing rather slowly. But yeah, it should make a, and a very good one. Any more books in the, uh, in the orphan? Well, not really, no. I don't really think like that. I sit down on a whim and start to write. I don't think, oh, I'll write a book next year. I find myself writing a book at the time. I don't mm. plan it. I don't plan it, really. I just take one day at a time. <laughs> You're very wise, I yeah. think. OK, well, for the moment, uh, Stephen, Jared, Hayden, uh, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Welcome back. The Wayward Festival, produced by Chester Performs, provides fun and exciting opportunities for reading, writing and sharing through um, adventure and exploration. The first festival took place in February 2014 and welcomed thousands of people to venues across Chester, Winsford and Ellesmere Port. We visited the recent event to find out what it's all about. our second year. Uh, we started last year and uh, this year we've got bigger and better. We've got uh, events all half term week uh, this, this week in February. Um, we've had uh, authors and we've got astronomer, we've got a beatboxer later on today. Uh, we've got all sorts of things going on and there's also free activities here in the town hall in Chester um, and sort of arts and crafts kind of things going on and in the library in Chester and in five other libraries around Cheshire. The core of it is about books, but we'd, we'd like to branch out. It's about more about storytelling, getting uh, stories across, and you can do that in a, in a number of ways, any different way. So we've had TV writers. Uh, we had the woman yesterday who wrote uh, Eve, which is a new CBBC show, and she was telling us how she doesn't write novels, but she writes scripts. Um, and also we've got storytellers uh, coming along. Uh, we've got people who won the Cheshire Prize for Literature, which this year was for children. Uh, and so we've got five of those people coming along tomorrow. Uh, and they're gonna be, some of them are poems. So we have poets, that's another way to get a story across. Um, people who've illustrated things. So drawing is another way to get your, your message across. And um, is beatboxing getting a story across? I don't know, maybe it is. It'll be fun anyway. We're just trying to make things fun. We have got um, a film challenge, challenge that happened sort of in the run up to the festival. And we've got those, um, up on the stage in the town hall here. Uh, we've got them running on a loop and you can vote for uh, your, your favourite uh, story. So that's another way, I mean, that is digital. People have, uh, kids have done it on their phones as well as on their cameras. Uh, and then they've used the, they've used software to edit them and they're all amazing, they're fantastic. But, uh, so that's a, that's a way of digitally telling stories as well. Daisy Hurst, who's our resident illustrator, who's done amazing pictures all week. Uh, she's just sitting at the back of all the events uh, and drawing them, and we've got them on our website. Well, she came up with the idea. She's done it before, online, actually, but she's never done it live, um, I don't think, uh, of a picture book jam. So what happens is Daisy and Kate Pankhurst, who's also uh, written Mariella mystery books, she's just done an event here this morning. Uh, what they do is they write a, they draw, sorry, a, a page of a picture book each, and then they swap them and finish each other's story and carry on doing the story like that. Uh, and so we'll end up with two stories that they're pinning them up, they're pegging them up above themselves as, they've, as they're doing them. And uh, the kids, it's, it's marvellous, it's all very informal and the kids are crowding around and asking them what to do and telling them what to do. Uh, and so in about half an hour's time, we should have two new, brand new stories uh, pegged up on our, on our gazebo inside the town hall, so it'd be great.
Picture Book Jam today, uh, it was Paul's idea, it's, although it's something that I've done before, it's just a kind of way to generate ideas for a story really quickly um, by one person starting off as the story and the next person then takes it over and then you swap backwards and forwards. So it just makes you come up with crazy things that sort of as an answer to questions the other person sort of asks with their pictures. <laughs> um, I've done the Picture Book Jam once before with another illustrator, Becky Palmer. Um, and I've done quite a lot of comics jams, which is a more usual thing, happens more often, um, where people make up comic strips together. So I've done that quite a lot. But I have done comics jams sort of by email, by post. You can make a story with someone over a long distance in that way, and it's really it's a fun way to make up new ideas. But you know, you never know what's going to happen anyway. Even if you're doing this with someone that you know really well and you've done it before, it's always going to surprise you, and that's kind of the point. So it's really good to just it's a it's a good way to get to know someone in a way. I was invited to come along uh, by the festival to do an event linked to my books, uh, my Mariella mystery series, and Daisy is the. Um, the festival illustrator so um, they asked me would I like to come and join her and just bounce some ideas off each other and produce uh, a couple of books in a short space of time. This is the first time I've been to the Wayward Festival um, but yeah it's been a really enjoyable morning so far, lots of exciting things going on. I met Daisy last night actually for the first time, um, I've been looking at her work, I knew that she was going to be here so I've been looking at some of her picture books but yeah so it's great to, because illustrators and authors work on their own so much it's lovely to come to events like this and actually meet another illustrator and talk a bit about how you work and different ways of thinking of ideas. was really involving the children a lot in what should go into the story and what should happen next and that was really good because they have great crazy ideas too. <laughs> I, I had a kind of vague idea about a parcel before we began at all um, which I did put into the picture but then I got the idea of the character from the children but normally I would just I don't know just something comes into my head quite easily I have no end of kind of silly animals in my head um, from just doodling and like, that kind of thing all the time. I think you can get, it's a bit like, it's the same with improvisation games in drama that probably children might do in school and things as well, that um, you can get to a point where it feels like, I don't know how to move this on, we just keep doing the same thing again and again. And that's kind of the thing that most easily goes wrong is you get stuck and it's like, okay, we've got to completely change scene. You have to think of some big way to move everything on. handy that the, the children were watching us actually, children are a really good source of ideas so I work in schools and do events like this um, and it's great just to hear the kind of bonkers ideas that they come up with um, so they chose the starting point for the picture book jam, uh, they sort of gave us some settings and a couple of characters and I find once you start drawing the ideas just kind of come out, you don't know that the ideas are there in your head but they are, they kind of come out onto the paper as soon as you start moving your, your pen or your pencil around. I think it's just to kind of make sure your story's moving at quite an interesting pace and it's not kind of staying still for too long um, and maybe also if you get asked to draw something that you're not too familiar with drawing, I can't draw horses so if any children say oh a unicorn or a horse I'm like oh maybe, maybe think of another idea. <laughs> So yeah, if you get something like a little bit sticky that you, you avoid drawing it all of the times and loads of people are watching you drawing it, but the children didn't really want um, didn't really want gruesome endings. At one point the stories were kind of heading towards a bit of a gruesome end and the children were like, oh no, no, it should be like a happy ending, which I thought they, they would want the kind of gruesome, scary ending, but the, the snail babies um, and the, the crocodiles and the pig, all everything ended happily for them.
If you have any comments or suggestions, please do contact the show at artsalivebooks at baytvliverpool.com. We look forward to hearing from you. I'll see you on the next edition of Arts Alive Books. Good night. <laughs>